Hello, this is Dr. Eric Bricker and thank you for watching A Healthcare Z. Today's topic is a review of health insurance earnings calls. So what I did is I went out and I listened to the second quarter of 2021, this year, the earnings call of the largest insurance carriers in America. Now, I listened to the conference calls of United Health Group for CVS Aetna or CVS Health, Cigna, and Anthem. And as I was listening to these calls, I wanted to hear what these companies were saying to their investors in terms of what their priorities were. And here is what these, interestingly, this is what every single one of these companies said on their earnings calls. They said that growth is going to come and has come from government programs, in other words, Medicare Advantage and Medicaid Managed Care through contracts with states, and through increased script count on the PBM side. In other words, the more scripts were being written by doctors and filled by patients, the better that was for the business of United Health Group because they've got OptumRx as a PBM, for CVS Aetna because they've got Caremark as a PBM, for Cigna because they have previous Express Scripts as a PBM, now Anthem's got a PBM. Okay, so fascinatingly, what did every single one of these conference calls not say? For employer-sponsored health plans, there was zero mention of helping their employer clients as a source of growth. Employers are not a source of growth for health insurance companies in America. It's all from Medicare Advantage, Medicaid, and from their PBMs. Okay, so now, I'm mean, kind of thinking, scratching my head. Okay, now, in digital health, there is a ton of money being poured in to help employer-sponsored health plans, to help self-funded employers. In fact, there was $14 billion invested in digital health companies by venture capital and private equity in 2020. It was the biggest year yet. It's been going up and to the right. Now, and additionally, so all those investors are not putting in their money willy-nilly. They want a return. So what kind of returns have there been? Just in the IPO market alone in 2020, there was... $37 billion in market capitalization from new digital health IPOs in 2020 alone. Now, if you look, and if you look at like companies that have already IPO'd in the past and what their market capitalization is, look, Teladoc's one of the biggest ones. They've got a market capitalization of $22.6 billion. Let's compare that to Cigna's market cap, which is only $70 billion, and Anthem's market cap, which is only $87 billion. So look, if Cigna had bought Teladoc, you know, Teladoc's been around for a long time. Let's say Cigna went out and they bought Teladoc four, five, six years ago, then they could have increased their market capitalization by over a like over 30% if you added on the 22.6 billion to Cigna's 70 billion. Likewise, it'd be a huge addition to Anthem's market, market cap as well. So what's going on here? Why is it that we've got private equity and venture capital who actually thinks that there's tremendous opportunity for return on capital invested in digital health for employer-sponsored health plans. And here you have the incumbents, you have the health insurance carriers who are like, yep, we're just not that interested. Not an area of growth for us. What's going on? Okay, here's what I think is going on is that when it comes to the health insurance carriers versus venture capital and private equity, it takes me back to a conversation that I had actually at one of the largest health insurance companies in America when I was co-founder, chief medical officer of Compass. They invited us to their office and we had a meeting with their president and their vice president of marketing and their COO and a couple of their product people. And they said, what are you doing in this healthcare navigation space? So we had a short conversation with them and they said, you know what? We really think of ourselves as a fast follower. You've gained tr quite a, a, an amount of traction in the marketplace. We're going to copy what you do and offer it to our customers so that they use us instead of you. Aha! So the health insurance carriers are really fast followers. They're not going to, they don't really quote unquote innovate. They just want to copy. And look, I'm not criticizing that strategy. They're so big that maybe that makes sense for them, okay? So really the innovation is coming from the 
uh, the venture and private equity backed uh, digital healthcare companies because the health insurance carriers themselves, they can't really innovate and, and they know they're just going to copy. They're going to neutralize. They're not going to try to out innovate the innovators. They're just going to be like, look, you've got some new uh, mousetrap. We're going to try to copy that and just make it good enough. So what does that mean? What's the implication of that? That means if you're an employer and you're talking to a health insurance carrier, are they really quote unquote innovating or are they just talking about innovation? Well, if you listen to their conference calls, they're not really innovating in the employer space because it's not an area of growth for them. Okay, implication number two. Okay, so what are the carriers actually doing with their employer-sponsored health plans? They're getting this good enough innovation from fast following from the digital health folks of the world, and they're going out and they, they've got their existing uh, employer-sponsored health plan, both self-funded and fully-insured groups, and they're going out to hospital systems, and they're negotiating PPO network discounts that, frankly, are not that good, right? There's the Pew Research study that says that the PPO discounts are still anywhere. You're still paying like 250% of Medicare is your allowed amount, right? So why are they giving away the farm on these high allowed amounts for their employer sponsors? It's because those same health insurance carriers are also negotiating HMO contracts with those hospital systems and physician groups for much lower unit cost reimbursement and they're using those HMO contracts to service what? Their Medicare Advantage and their Medicaid customers. And what does that mean? I'll leave a link in the show notes to one of my prior AEF Care Z videos. The margin on a Medicare Advantage beneficiary is about $1,600 per person per year. The margin for a member on an employer-sponsored health plan is only about $800 per year. That's right. Not only is Medicare Advantage the faster growing portion of a health insurance carrier's business, it's also the more profitable portion of a health insurance carrier's business. So it's growing and it's more profitable. Guess what they're going to pay attention to? That, not employers. So they're essentially selling the employers down the river so that they can negotiate better terms on their HMO contracts to run their Medicare Advantage and Medicaid managed care folks through and they can make more money on. Now, they are using employers and employer-sponsored health plans to monetize their government program customers. So, I could be wrong. I'm not saying this is a wrong strategy. I'm just saying, if you're an employer, it would behoove you to listen to the investor calls of your health insurance carrier so that you can understand what their true priorities are. And that's my point for today. Thank you for watching A Healthcare Z.